All right, it is three minutes past 11.30, so I think we're gonna get started. Um, thanks for joining again. Uh, this event is going to be about securing your network blind spots with artificial intelligence. Um, we're going to start with a quick Comport introduction, and then I'm going to turn it over to our experts, Justin and Joe, for a discussion, and then we will have a Q&A. Um, Comport, if you guys don't know, is a solutions partner. Um, we have technology solutions under our first brand of te Comport Technology Solutions. We provide data center, um, di digital business transformation, and what we'll be talking about today would be our IT security products. Um, we also have managed services under our Comport Secure brand, and we have a whole branch that focuses on our Comport healthcare solutions, including wireless healthcare, medical data management, and EHR infrastructure, and more. We have been in the industry for over 40 years. Uh, we're headquartered out of Ramsey, New Jersey, but we have four other locations as well um, in New England, New York, Mid-Atlantic, and Central. Um, our technical expertise ranges all the way from endpoints to data center to security and networking. Um, these are just a list of Comport solutions and services. Today, we're really going to be focused in on security solutions and how to help you. Um, our cybersecurity solutions, proactive security, and managed security services are helping clients um, stay secure in this new world of constant attacks. One thing that Comport prides itself on is being able to guide our customers through their digital transformations, whether you're starting on premise, um, trying to fix fragmented security, um, we move you all the way through your migration journey, hopefully getting you over to a security path with AI and machine learning, which is really what's needed in this day and age. As I mentioned, we have managed services. Um, in this case, we'll talk a little bit about our security managed services. Um, we work with your team to secure both your data center and your endpoints, and we'll be continually monitoring if you work with Comport for managed security services. Um, we also have a simple billing, so monthly billing, which makes your life easier. Um, and a technical account manager that you can contact. It's not gonna change, so it's someone that you continually work with. And of course, reporting after the fact, um, especially if you have to deal with compliance or other items like that, our team can help you. So today, I'm gonna introduce our speakers, Justin Youngblood. Um, he is Comport's field CTO for security. Um, he helps our customers monitor, prevent, and react to security inc incidences. And Joe is um, the pre-sales engineering team lead for Arista's security division. Um, he is a veteran security engineer and provides consultative and architectural expertise for um, customers. So with that, I'm gonna let them kind of have their discussion. Awesome, thank you. So we're gonna try something a little bit different today than what uh, you might have seen in the past from us where today's event, we're not gonna do, you saw the last PowerPoint slide um, for today's event. So what we're gonna try and do is just have more of a, a technical deep dive conversation around some of Arista security products focused around their uh, awake acquisition that they did a number of years ago, which is now just called Arista NDR. Um, so as I was kind of already introdu introduced, my name is Justin Youngblood. I'm a field CTO at Comport, been with us for over a year now. And one of my responsibilities is uh, as that role to look at what else is out in the market and what is unique to uh, the market that can help stabilize and increase our security posture. So with that, I'll let Joe introduce himself. Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Joe Malenka. I'm based out of the New York metro area, although I cover uh, most of the Eastern US for Arista's NDR division. And I run the pre-sales technical team over here uh, for all things NDR or network security related here at Arista. Uh, prior to Arista, I was doing a number of different security startups. And if you go far enough back, I was at RSA Security over a decade ago. So I've been doing a lot of different uh, security ventures and uh, InfoSec related 
uh, activities on the vendor side uh, for numerous different clients across all, all different industries. Awesome. So how this, how this is going to work is I have a couple of questions I want to ask Joe and those will kind of turn into whatever they turn into. This is uh, semi-scripted, right? So we don't, I don't know what Joe's going to say. He doesn't know what I'm going to say, but he has a rough idea what those questions are. So with that, I heavily encourage you in the chat windows, um, ask some other questions. We can pop those in um, and make this as interactive as possible. So if there's questions that you have as you start to hear more and more about what NDR is, how it works, uh, feel free to, to, to chime in and, and ask your own questions. So the first and most basic question is, Joe, what, what is NDR to Arista and what is NDR to, to you yourself? Yeah, so NDR stands for Network Detection and Response and uh, kind of came to fruition uh, after the focus on the endpoint. So if you go back maybe a decade ago, um, it was very clear that standard antivirus and, and signature-based approaches were not really going to, uh, to cut it, right? Really identify the more sophisticated threats. And this is going back to, you know, 2005, 2010, that, that era. And prior to that, we had IPS and IDS, and, and that was only so effective as well. And, and of course, attackers, they're always trying to stay uh, ahead, of the, um, ahead of being detected. They're always trying to outrun the uh, the defenders, right, and and try to get lucky before anybody can stop them and and steal whatever data they're looking for or hold it ransom or whatever it might be. Uh, and so, really, the genesis of NDR was uh, kind of applying the same type of approach, the next gen AV or or the endpoint detection response to the network security field. And so, with uh, with the broad increase in attacks and sophistication of attacks uh, over the past uh, you know couple of decades really uh, there's always new tools that need to be introduced to to keep up with uh, these attackers and to be able to identify these more sophisticated uh, threat actors whether they're nation states or cyber criminals like ransomware gangs or or anyone else really uh, and so in a, in addition to you know, EDR, the endpoint, focusing on the endpoint, where you install an agent and you're looking for any malicious processes or uh, or services that might be running. Uh, and in addition to SEM, where you're doing log correlation, log aggregation analysis, uh, you really do need to look at uh, the network as well and take a good, good close look at what's going on there because not every device is going to produce logs. Uh, and not every device can have an endpoint agent running on it, especially with the proliferation of so many IoT devices ranging from you know, phones and, and cameras uh, or security cameras to uh, TVs. And, and even, you know, my, even my washing machine and my refrigerator at my home want to get on the Wi-Fi, right? Everything is smart controlled now. And so there's this massive proliferation of, of uh, network connected devices. And there's been different attacks that have leveraged those to infiltrate large organizations. Of, of, if you're not familiar with it, the, the target attack uh, back, I think it was 2013 or 2014, uh, you know, that, that came through an HVAC vendor uh, and through the HVAC system wirelessly connected. Uh, and if you look at some of the other attacks, there was one where, you know, the, the Chinese were able to infiltrate an organization by by leveraging the aquarium, which was connected to the, the network. So uh, there's really any, any vector can be used by attackers in this day and age. And so uh, there needs to be a, a good focus on detecting and responding to uh, these more sophisticated threats uh, uh, that can only be seen from the network really. Yeah, interesting. So kind of the way I see it is, it kind of leveling up from, you know, if you compared a, an ACL firewall to a next-gen firewall, that's what we're doing with, with the old school IPS in the data center, right? Instead of just looking at signatures and, and looking at what we know is bad, we're looking at kind of all the different things going on in the network, putting some trending and some benchmarks around that data. Um, and like you, like you mentioned, the all the IoT devices out there, Raspberry Pis, aquariums, washers and dryers, um, uh, all those kind of things that we that we see out there, you can't deploy an agent on those devices. How do you ensure that those devices are talking to the right things that they need 
get talked to because they do call home. They do need to reach out to that mothership to get instructions, know what to do. And those things are okay, but how do we prevent it or be aware of what it's doing um, when it shouldn't be? Right. So now we kind of have a super high level baseline of what NDR is. What, what makes Arista's NDR unique or special in the industry compared to um, your competitors and other products that you see out there? Well, I think, um, you know, our approach starts over a decade ago when, um, uh, when Awake Security was initially founded. So Arista's NDR solution is through an acquisition. Arista acquired Awake Security about two and a half years ago. Uh, and the, the genesis of Awake Security um, was through a, a venture capital company uh, by the name of Greylock Partners. And Greylock uh, is pretty well known. They, they were the ones behind Palo Alto. So they incubated Palo Alto and brought that into fruition as the next gen firewall. And so uh, they also then, after Palo Alto's success, decided that there's still a lot of work to be done in the network security space from a uh, an analysis perspective for threat hunting and forensic investigation and incident response purposes. So they brought together all the founders. Interestingly enough, none of the founders actually knew each other uh, here at Awake Security, uh, but they were pulled in from different uh, organizations to really create something that would be uh, much more valuable and useful in the hands of security analysts uh, for those purposes that I described earlier. And so uh, the first and foremost uh, goal was to make something that was intuitive, that would allow a security analyst or researcher to quickly identify threats very accurately, uh, and also not have to rely on uh, like a, a asset management system or a CMDB, right? Because when you're doing uh, when you're doing any type of threat hunting or forensic investigations. You want to be able to quickly assess what the devices are, right? If you if all you see is an IP address, that doesn't really give you um, the context that you need as a security analyst to make a, a difficult decision about, hey, do I go and take the executive's laptop away from her or from him? Do I uh, do I have to reimage any of these devices or maybe? Uh, maybe segment this network or bring even bring down the data center. That happened to uh, one guy I met last year. He had to actually, they had to take the data center offline because the ransomware gang had infiltrated everything. And that severely impacted the business, obviously. Um, but uh, those kinds of very difficult decisions have to be made in near real time where the threats, the, the attackers are moving as fast as they can so the responders have to be able to respond quickly. And, and job number one is figure out what those devices are. Oftentimes though, asset management systems like a CMDB uh, or even LDAP and Active Directory that are used to define which devices are in the environment uh, or to, to monitor or record or keep a record of those devices, oftentimes they're out of date. Uh, they're not maintained as well as they should. And so for us, we identify what those devices are using AI fingerprinting without the need to have any tie into any third party system. So we're using every little weak signal that we can get from uh, the packet header information, from the metadata, from any, anything that's on the network to try to figure out what those devices are. Um, one big attack that we uncovered was where a malicious insider was silently recording the chief financial officer's uh, telephone conversation. And, uh, and, and knowing that it's a polycom phone and not just a Linux server or a Windows desktop or an iPhone, you know, knowing it's an, an actual IoT device and what type of device that is, is critical to uncovering real threats in the environment. The second really important thing that our NDR solution does is to accurately identify threats. So, for those who are familiar with, um, you know, firewalls, in, or even before firewalls, IPS, IDS, um, in, in those early days of detection and, and antivirus, they were infamous for having loads of false positives. And there's still a lot of tools out there today that generate so much noise. And and uh, you know, even the target, um, the target compromise almost a decade ago, you know, in that incident, they actually got the alert from from their uh, FireEye devices, 
but there were so many other alerts coming that it was lost in the noise. And so that's really the, the second challenge that a lot of security analysts face today is trying to sort through all this noise and figure out where the real threats are. So our goal is to reduce all of that noise, to maximize the number of true positives, minimize the number of false positives and false negatives so that we don't miss anything, so that those who are doing the threat hunting, the, those who are doing the incident response or, or uh, in, any of that initial triage um, of trying to figure out if, if there's a real threat in the environment, uh, we want to have that, that noise be almost zero, as, as close to zero as we can. Uh, and so that is really, really one of the big differentiators is that the level of accuracy, uh, the, the high level of signal to noise, that ratio is very significant when compared to other uh, tools that are out there in the security space. And then lastly, I would say it's, it's the level of automation that we provide. Um, we automate much of what a tier one or tier two analyst would do when investigating, when responding to these alerts and uh, ensuring that uh, those investigators maximize their time. So we have something called AVA or the Autonomous Virtual Assist. You can kind of think of it like an Alexa for your, your security analyst, you know, and at home, maybe you ask Alexa to play music or maybe even have it set up to dim lights or shut off, you know, shut off electronic components in your house. Whatever that might be, our, our goal here is to provide kind of an expert system that can respond to requests to go out and do additional threat hunting that might relate to what an investigator and an analyst is already looking into, going backwards in time, going forwards in time to try to find where there's additional compromised devices or tools, tactics, or procedures that attackers are leveraging that have not yet been uh, identified. And so by, by doing that, we can take the number of hours that an, an analyst is spending on a given event and reduce that down to minutes and, and thereby making the whole security team much more efficient and effective in what they're, what they're trying to accomplish. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of information with one question. So I, I, what I find interesting when, when customers start to look at Arista's MDR and they start to figure out what the use cases are, they're not really buying a tool to collect well they are, but they're, they're acquiring a tool that can collect all this data and kind of help complement an EDR and all these things. But they when they start to uncover the AVA side of it, and the nucleus side of it, and, and the central management characteristics that it have, they start to look at it as well. This is my this is my first tool that my SOC is going to use, or maybe I don't have a SOC, but I have a eight by five um, security analyst that's that's you know their job is to do hunting and look through firewall logs and all that kind of stuff. This is the first tool they log into every morning to see what happened since the last time they logged in, versus just looking at the alerts. They're using this tool to um, do the hunting itself and do all that stuff. So it ends up being that kind of core to what could be a SOC as that customer gets larger or um, requires 24 by 7 service, things like that. You, know, you mentioned all the all the noise that other tools bring. You know, this this particular tool is really trying to hone in on all the different things that are going on and alert you when it matters and try and figure out what's going on before it sends out those alerts. So it's not, it's you know, Kind of on that line of not too late but not too early with with those alerts um and then the other thing you mentioned that i heard was kind of that static data versus dynamic data you're not taking you're not looking at ad to understand where people are at in the environment and who they are you're actually looking at that kerberos transaction that's happening identifying that user identifying that device kind of stitching that together when that user moves you get to see it instantaneously once they move. The moment they move to a different building, you know it versus waiting for an AD log to catch up later, right? So those are all kind of keeping keeping that information, you know, near real time to real time. Correct. So wh what type of customers would benefit more from an NDR or what customers may not benefit, you know, different shapes, sizes, you might be in healthcare, you might, um, be a manufacturing company or a retail space, uh, you might be big, you might be small. What customers do you see gain the most momentum with your product and maybe other customers that they may not need a product like yours? What, what do you see in the industry with, with what you've worked with so far? Yeah, so uh, we work with, with all sorts of organizations, large and small, um, and really across every vertical from 
you know, financials and, and healthcare to manufacturing and retail. Uh, one of our largest, uh, we're, we're one of our largest customers in oil and gas, and uh, another one is a huge technology uh, software services provider. Uh, and there's there's just a, a real big mix of different organizations, different industries, and that's the reason why is because everybody's targeted, right? The the attackers aren't aren't saying, oh, we're gonna not attack that industry or or, or that type of organization just because they're in a particular vertical. Uh, and so, you know, attackers are, are very opportunistic. They're going to look for whatever they can to uh, either find sensitive data uh, or steal and, and ransom that data uh, and to, to try to make money that way. And so that opportunistic uh, approach to their hacking, their, their targeting of, of different organizations means that no one's really safe. Um, now, that said, not everybody is a great fit for uh, for uh, an Arista or for an NDR solution, and uh, I would say, for example, um, those environments that are super dynamic, that are heavily leveraging containers um, in the cloud, right? So one one that I know of is a retailer, and they when they're going to do some sort of a flash sale and spin up a bunch of containers to um, you know, to accommodate all the the, uh, the internet um, traffic that's going to suddenly hit them for a particular sale that may only last a few hours. You know, they turn on these these containerized environments to house all the additional load on the network and, and the app servers and the web servers and whatnot. Um, and then they just right after the sale is over, they spin it back down, right? And uh, and attackers aren't going to really go after that because it's so temporal or and short in its in its nature um and it's in existence and and we're not targeting that either right um attackers really try to go after more long-standing assets applications um data sets where they can come in map out the environment that it you know dynamic environment but not so dynamic that it only lasts a few hours right <laughs> and uh, and then move quickly to find the, the crown jewels and and steal those um and so that's really our environment uh, where where we specialize in is both on-prem and cloud-based workloads, hybrid environments, but not you know not super short-lived. Um, and and we really do well across all of the different industries to provide value to the security teams to to give them the information that they need to defend themselves. So uh, I would say that's kind of where where we really uh, we really shine and provide great value to our our customer base. Gotcha, cool. So you know, there's no vertical that you're you're better at or worse at, right? It's it's really based on the time of life of of that asset, right? So if, like you mentioned, if it's a Docker container, it's gonna be up for an hour down and then get back down for that use case. That's not something you're gonna have enough time to posture, identify, and see what's normal and see what's not so normal with that with that. But if it's a, a web farm that static and it's, it's always running 24 by 7 you're going to be able to understand what that environment looks like and understand the type of transactions that workload's doing and be able to kind of find those needles in the haystack that a firewall may not see is that kind of what i'm hearing yeah yeah and it, and it doesn't have to be a static environment it can be dynamic because you know i mean networks always are dynamic right they're always changing there's always the devices being added but not so not so ephemeral and and, and short lived that you know it's not something that that could be profiled and watched over the course of, of weeks uh, or even months right so um, yeah I think most environments though uh, are are kind of the more traditional environment where you have something that is longer lived and therefore you know attackers might target that more readily and and that's really what we're going after. Gotcha. Cool. So tell me, I know that your product was really kind of born with the idea of all workload is encrypted, right? So whether it's an SSL or, you know, whatever type of encryption methodology you use, you guys were born with the idea of, I'm not going to be able to crack the payload and be the man in the middle, like an SSLO um, product and be able to inspect payload to understand what's going on. You have to work with that metadata level. So you're looking at TCP, UDP headers and understanding what that is. So kind of walk me through why you guys started with that methodology and and how you kind of manage that not being able to see all of the data but still make up what that data is trying to do 
Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so yeah, if you go back, you know, 10, 12, 13 years ago, you there, I would say probably about, um, you know, 80% of the traffic was unencrypted, right, in, in clear text and the banking websites there, those were encrypted, but the vast majority of content out there was not. Um, and fast forward to today, you know, 2023, and, and you know, we're over 80% encrypted now and, and approaching 90%, you know, there's still HTTP being used uh, and there's still other other protocols, but, you know, the vast majority of traffic out there is encrypted. And so gaining an understanding of, of whether that traffic has, uh, is, is an attacker doing something malicious requires an understanding of how encryption works. And rather than decrypt it, you know, there are, there are vendors out there that do decryption and SSL termination, man in the middle, um, that has its own set of challenges, right? That has uh, challenges around certificate management, um, user experience, uh, privacy laws, and boy, a lot's a lot of talk about the world 10 or 15 years ago, right? Um, GDPR in Europe, but you know, the privacy laws just didn't exist. Now you have all the, the privacy laws with GDPR in Europe, uh, California privacy laws. I know New York just signed some, uh, some privacy laws into, into uh, law. There's other, you know, there's other uh, states following suit in, in countries as well. Uh, and so that's more and more of a challenge, um, not to mention, you know, the technical challenges around like TLS 1.3 and perfect forward secrecy, you know, th that can all still be, be monitored if you're, if you're doing a man in the middle SSL inspection, but it's, it's, it, there's challenges, right? And it's costly. Whereas our approach is to say, well, look, there's lots of weak signals that are given off by different encrypted protocols. So think about TLS, what goes into a, a TLS session creation, right? There's, there's uh, several back and forth um, uh, uh, conversations before the actual encrypted session begins to establish the SSL, the, the key that's gonna be used during that TLS session. Same thing with uh, SSH or RDP or a myriad of different um, you know, popular protocols these days. Uh, you have to have a way to analyze those protocols without having to decrypt them. And so if you sit and watch and you look, you do very fine grained analysis. So we're, we're not just doing, you know, layers two, three, and four in, in the OSI model with, you know, MAC address and IP address and UDP, TCP session data. We're going all the way up into layers five, six, and seven, right? The, the presentation layer, the datagram, the, the um, you know, the presentation layer to identify full deep packet inspection uh, to identify where is there some sort of indicator or set of indicators that might help us understand uh, if the uh, the intent of that session is malicious. So think about uh, a TLS cipher suite, right? If you see a very unique TLS client cipher suite that's not being used by any other device in the organization, well, that's a weak signal, right? Uh, if you see a particular user agent string, and those can obviously be spoofed. Uh, or if you see a particular um, uh, destination where maybe the domain just got registered two weeks ago and it's kind of shady, you know, maybe a shady name server or, or a country or what have you. There, there's all sorts of clues that if you can take these weak signals and, and combine them together, you get a, a, a more um, clear picture of if if that traffic is malicious or not. Uh, so we do encrypted traffic analysis, ETA. And one of the things that we're analyzing as well is SSH traffic. And even though we can't see inside that SSH session, we can figure out, is that a command versus a keystroke? Uh, is that an upload or a download? Is that an authentication, a success or fail of authentication with SSH? Um, and then looking at it, inspecting, you know, figuring out what the devices are that are both the, the source and the target from a communication perspective and doing all sorts of analysis on that as well. The nature of the device, the operating system, the type, when did we first see it and last see it, what makes it unique, uncommon and frequent relative to the other uh, devices or, or other users or traffic on the network, right? Again, all of those things are weak signals that when combined together, uh, provide a much higher level of confidence around ascertaining if it's you know, differentiating between malicious and benign encrypted traffic.
Yeah, interesting. I've, I've done enough uh, SSLO deployments where I enjoy never having to do it again. They're, you know, to your point, they're very complicated. There's all sorts of privacy things. We need to make sure that every single bank uh, is not decrypted. Um, even some like Facebook type products out in the world there, we need to make sure those aren't encrypted to ensure employee privacy. It just gets outside of technology, tech, the technical component of it's hard enough with just the certs, but then the political side of it gets, gets super complicated internally with that organization of what do we, what can we decrypt and what shouldn't we decrypt to keep our employees uh, privacy protected. Um, you know, so it's, it, and, and then to, to build it to, kind of decode encrypted data without decrypting it is what you're doing and then stitching together all these little conversations together and understanding these types of devices don't do this normally and now I'm seeing one of them do it now I'm seeing three of them do it and kind of use that decoder ring to understand what's going on without ever seeing the actual like the word I was using before the payload um, is, is super fascinating to build a stitch all the information together and actually create a nice dashboard with, with that with that data. Yep. Oh, super cool. Yeah. So tell me, shifting gears. So tell me, um, like the deployment process for this product. I, I know that you can deploy into like a traditional network core. Um, you can deploy into a data center, whether it's physical or virtual. You can even tie into the campus side of the world. Um, and then we talked about cloud a little bit earlier too. You can you can kind of deploy in all four of those major areas. So literally wherever you have uh, assets, you can tie your tool into there. Kind of Walk me through the type of deployments, different types of, of avenues you can collect that data with. Sure, yeah. Um, so in, in any given network, right, there needs to be a way to mirror traffic. And traditionally that's done with SPAN or TAP, packet brokers, TAP aggregators. And those technologies simply take data that's flowing through a, a, a router or a switch and mirror it to some destination. And so we're, or we have sensors that can be physical or virtual. Uh, they're out of band though, they're passive. So we're not going to take down the network if we have any trouble on our side uh, because we're just receiving, we're just listening to traffic as it comes into our sensors. Uh, those sensors can be very small. Um, they can be one U or, or two U appliances sitting in the data center to receive traffic from like a core switch or, or what have you. Um, they could be virtual, right? If you have an ESX farm, we could put in a, a, a VM to monitor the virtual traffic going across the virtual network. Um, we even have an AMI for AWS. So if you want to monitor uh, traffic in the public cloud in the AWS, we can provide that. So we're looking at through the, the traffic through uh, AWS's VPC traffic mirroring. Um, Google Cloud, GCP has an analogous feature as well. And Azure um, is uh, has released it in beta. Uh, took it out and uh, we're awaiting their GA release here as well. So you'll soon be able to analyze or, or mirror traffic within uh, in Azure as well. Uh, and then on the uh, on the switch itself, for those organizations that actually have Arista gear, you know, Arista switches, Arista routers, uh, we have that capability to be able to um, identify traffic as it's getting switched. So you think on the switch itself, going from one port to another, there's a packet that's traversing that switch. While that packet is traversing the switch, we can grab the packet header and the metadata from that and send that to the nucleus for analysis. So that's a really cool feature that's built right into the switch itself uh, for those who are Arista customers. But for those who are not, you can still do the traditional way of just span or tap. So for, for non-Arista customers, if you have some sort of a core switch and whether it's a, you know, a few hundred megabits per second or gigabits per second, uh, or even a terabit per second, you know, we can analyze that traffic for malicious intent to, to identify those attackers that are trying to blend in with the background process. So the, the, the goal of that, the, the function, the core function of that sensor, whether it's physical, virtual, cloud-based, or, or on the switch itself, is just get the packet header information, get, just get the metadata, uh, to the nucleus for analysis. And the nucleus does that device identification, uh, the adversarial modeling to determine what type of traffic is malicious or not with a very high signal to noise ratio, right? Very low noise, very high signal. Uh, and, uh, and then finally, applying that level of automation that's all done either on-prem with the nucleus or in the cloud, we can provide the nucleus as a service. And so it can be wholly contained 
uh, even offline as a deployment. It can be online and in the data center or campus or uh, remote locations. It can be in manufacturing facilities uh, or it can be in the cloud. It really doesn't matter where it is. We just want to look at that traffic as it's floating by on the network and do that analysis, that passive out of band analysis to identify uh, malicious intent. That's cool. So, yeah, to summarize that, like, it doesn't matter where the data is, right? That's kind of preface it. It doesn't matter where the data is. It doesn't matter what tools you have today. We can collect that data in one of many ways, whether it's a native span off of uh, any brand uh, switch platform that you have that supports it. Um, and we kind of talked about this in the past with other customers where we've seen Azure take away span port and certain components. So then kind of with a marriage of uh, Awake and Arista come together and come to light is the virtual EOS system being able to intercept that data and then get that data over to um, the nucleus to do that do that kind of tapping in the cloud um, and then not even get into the data fabric management product that Arista has where we can dedupe data and kind of crunch that data down before sending to. There's all sorts of different ways to to collect that data, but regardless of where the data is, what cloud provider it is, we can stitch all those different assets together and be all the different activities and, and then build that security posture based on based on all that stuff. So yeah, and one other point to make is that we actually do full packet capture, right? So we're collecting the PCAPs of the entire stack from layer seven all the way down to layer two. We're doing deep packet inspection. It's not just it's not just flow data like NetFlow or S flow. Mm -hmm. We're looking at everything uh, because everything could provide us with weak signals to infer stronger, more malicious signals. And so that's really what we need to do is going beyond that, you know, the easy flow data, that's kind of an easy target um, and do full packet capture, deep packet inspection to, to really get that level of detail, that level of resolution that's needed uh, to identify these more sophisticated threats. Yep, awesome, makes sense. So how, how do you work with, you know, every customer on the call today has made heavy investments in their firewalls and their, hopefully they've all upgraded from traditional antivirus to like an EDR solution. And we talked about how EDR can't deploy on a lot of IoT devices, but the firewall can protect those assets from the network. So how do you, you know, you're an, you're an out of band device, right? So you can't prevent data. So how do you work with those firewalls and those EDRs to turn that detection into a prevention scenario what what are your techniques there to kind of tie everything together leverage the customer's existing investments to make that holistic well i've never heard any organization come and tell me that they would like to install another agent on their endpoints <laughs> so we just want to use what uh what those organizations already have in place to do that response so if we see something malicious, like maybe DNS tunneling or, or initial access or some sort of an exploitation, right, or lateral movement, we're able to make calls via API to the EDR agent or the firewall, right, and be able to block those, those malicious uh, behaviors in real time. So if we see, yeah, there's some data exfil going off the firewall, but it's from a device that's not managed by EDR, we can still say, well, block this device. Don't let it communicate north, south, or east, west, right? And and the firewall can be leveraged to do that because it's already in band. Um, same thing with the EDR agent. If there is an agent running on it, we could make an API call to the endpoint service, the EDR service, and say, let's quarantine or contain that device so it's not able to uh, allow the attacker to pivot from that device into any other device on the network. Uh, and that's that's really important in stopping these fast acting uh, threat actors. You have to be able to respond like that. And uh, and so we want to use the tools that are already in place. Everybody has firewalls. Everybody has some agent running on the endpoint. And not not all the agents. And for those agents that aren't, we'll leverage the firewall or we'll leverage other uh, integrations that we have to do that. But uh, those pieces need to be in place, and they are in place, so so we can leverage those in our in our automated response or manual response, whatever it might be. Um, oftentimes, our organizations, our customers, our clients will deploy in a crawl, walk, run methodology where, hey, let's just get the NDR in place. Let's see what we have on our network. Let's see things that we're we're not seeing, um, and then once we've done that, let's move into 
uh, some level of manual enforcement or manual response. And then once we've done that for a period of time, we've proven the system, the solution, we can move into an automated uh, methodology where we can just turn on auto blocking for certain behaviors that we know are malicious. Yep, makes perfect sense. You obviously can't run run right into uh, let's block everything the moment we see an issue without learning the tool and the tool learning you, right? Um, and learning right. the environment. You know, so, you know, that, I think that's a really key thing because the, the NDR, you know, like I said before, it, it, it's not in band, so it can't immediately prevent an incident, but there's advantages of that. So if, if we right size an appliance that can, you know, a virtual appliance that can do one gig a second, or whatever that is, and we see more than one gig a second for a brief moment, that security tool didn't inhibit that network traffic. It just missed a, a chunk of data for that split second, but it still has got enough data to know what's going on and, and learn what's going on and then invoke uh, API call or uh, event to say, hey, firewall, hey, EDR, hey, um, tool, I need you to do this based on the relationships we've built with those API calls to prevent that, quarantine that device, um, turn off that web service, whatever that whatever that is to make that a real-time preventative tool. Um, so it's super we, neat. We consistently see where, where, you know, EDR and firewall and other, other tools, SEM, SOAR, they don't, they don't always pick up on everything, right? Mm -hmm. um, no tool's perfect out there, including our own, right? There's, there's no tool that's gonna detect everything. But you want several different vantage points, right? Defense in depth, layered security, to be able to detect something that other tools might miss and, and be able to then accord, respond accordingly. So yeah, ab absolutely. Yep, yeah, no tool's perfect. Um, you know, the, the, the idea of trying to have security posture, the, the attacker, they're playing the game of go fish, right? They just need to keep asking questions. Eventually they're gonna get the right answer. They're gonna get a match and now they have a way to get in. And maybe it's not a very good way in, but eventually it turns into something uh, more fruitful for them over time. Versus the security company, they're playing, you know, they're playing chess, they're playing Catan. Like it's a hard, it's a hard strategic, I need to know five steps ahead, five steps backwards. Um, we're not playing the game of getting lucky. We're playing the game of being, you know, very uh, deliberate with what we're doing, how we're doing it, all the regiments around that versus playing with someone's, you know, like I said, playing Goldfish or Connect Four. It's, it's much easier to be a hacker than it is to uh, prevent that hack uh, in general. So it, it takes an army, a village. Um, yeah, in fact, there was a good quote. I, I think it was Queen Elizabeth responding to the Irish Republican army where, where um, or no, vice versa. You know, they, they said, we only need to be lucky once you need to be lucky every single time right so attackers mm -hmm. they only have to get lucky once to get some foothold on the network and and do that whereas defenders we have to be lucky every single time to defend every attack that comes in in order to stay out of the the reach of the attackers yep yeah it's a lot of sleepless nights if you don't have the right tools so right. so tell me how um you know i kind of talked about this a little bit in the beginning where uh some customers have seen your tool and said, wow, this can be like the center of my stock, right? How do you um, get the skill set? Uh, kind of maybe a two-part question. So when, when a customer has good security analysts on their team, how does it benefit them? And then maybe the other way around where we don't have dedicated security team. We have people that can manage firewalls and make sure the EDR rules, but we don't have like dedicated security analysts. How does, how does that fit into those type of customers? Um, if, if you kind of pick up where I'm headed on, in those two questions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I would say for the first first question, there are um, uh, a number of different mature organizations out there that, that have spent a lot on security. They have a lot of tools, they have people, they have processes in place. Uh, and for those environments, we're probably not gonna come in there and be their, their main UI, right? They probably already using like a Splunk or, or some sort of a, a SEM or SOAR to, to be that, or maybe even a ticketing system like ServiceNow to get the initial um, alerts when they come in and handle those and triage those accordingly. And so we have integrations into all of those tools where we can take the malicious uh, behaviors that we detect and send those alerts into the SEM or, or SOAR or ticketing system or whatever it might be and do that, that, uh, that triage or that response immediately. Um, or other organizations that don't have 
especially small organizations or medium-sized organizations, they don't have dedicated security teams or SOC teams with those that tooling in place already, uh, and oftentimes need to rely on on managed security service providers, MSSPs, to be able to uh, provide that function for them to be able to defend them against those attacks uh, without having hiring those those people in their in their um, within their organization. And that's that's a challenge, right? That that's a whole other topic. Uh, because there's just not a lot of security analysts out there, right? There's, it's a, everybody wants to hire one, but they're elusive, right? There's, there's not a lot of people out there with that skill set. Um, people, a lot of people don't have the skills to be able to do any type of investigation or, or uh, incident response or even, you know, day-to-day -day threat hunting, which should be a, a hygienic uh, process that's in place in every organization. There should be threat hunting going beyond what your uh, tools are telling you. Uh, and so that's another thing that Arista can offer. In addition to an NDR platform, we also have uh, a managed security offering where we can do managed NDR for our customers. We have security analysts that come from uh, Mandiant, from Booz Allen Hamilton, from Strauss Friedberg, and many other organizations that have lots of extensive experience in, in uh, those areas in incident response, threat hunting, and forensic investigations. Uh, and they're positioned in London, in the United States, and in India, where we have this follow the sun model. Uh, so we're actually doing 24 by seven threat hunting for our customers. So we can either do that, that uh, full threat hunting for uh, organizations, or we can do it as an extension to organizations that may already have a security team or a SOC team in place. Uh, and, uh, and you know we've we've had situations where they say you know we've got it nine to five, but after hours and on weekends that's when we need that coverage right and that's fine we can do that too, um, but the point is that you know the sophisticated sophisticated attackers and and their latest and greatest um, uh, approaches and behaviors the TTPs that are they're leveraging in these attacks they require more sophisticated solutions and services people that that are up on the latest uh, methodologies and know how to use these tools. So we can also remove some of that um, daunting, uh, you know, feelings of, wow, a new tool, thread hunting, I'm not familiar with this. Well, let's just do it for the first year. Let's do MNDR for the first year. And uh, once you get familiar with the tool, then we'll take the training wheels off and you can do it on your own or, you know, you can continue with it. Uh, but I would say almost 80% uh, you know, almost four out of five of our customers do opt in for that managed NDR service because it's something that, you know, threat hunting is not something that people have time for. Uh, and unless they're a very mature organization with the teams, the people, the process, products, you know, it's, it's a real challenge. And, and so we can offer it just as a product or a product plus service to do that 24 by 7 threat hunting for them as well. Yep, that makes sense. You know, we see a lot of scenarios where the company or customer doesn't have uh, a dedicated person to do that stock analyst work, that hunting activity. It's someone that's wearing multiple hats. And when they have an alert with uh, end user having a problem or spending two hours doing hunting that day, you know, which one's going to drop first, right? So right, exactly. you know, they're always in that, they're always in that reactive mode, wearing those two to five hats, whatever, whatever their scenario is and, and struggling to keep up that hunting. So you guys can, Kind of take that role on yourself. Use the NDR as that core component to learn all the different things on the environment. Um, you know, kind of train Ava per se with that human element to actually make sure that everything's being caught and being you know done accurately. That's right. Yep. Cool. So how does uh you know we're kind of wrapping up, but if any other customers have questions, uh, again you know throw it in the chat and we can we can try and get to them. But how does a customer get to get engaged with Arista from an NDR perspective? How do they get to see this tool? How can they see this tool with their own data through like a POC or something like that to not just see some bells and whistles from a marketing perspective, but actually posture a subset of their environment and actually see the data uh, with their own hand, with their own eyes? Yeah, absolutely. So we offer um, both paid and free engagements. The paid engagements are extremely deep analysis uh, we call them network compromise assessments and uh, attack surface assessments and those kinds of engagements where we bring in equipment and we also leverage existing tools 
and we really do a, a deep dive into what's going on in a given organization's environment to try to identify threats that are already there or threats that might have an easier time getting in and moving laterally. Uh, but as far as just testing out the NDR tool that, that we've talked about today, that can be done very easily through just a four week proof of concept where we can ship a, a 2U appliance and then the traffic can just be mirrored, you know, install the appliance in the data center in a rack, mirror traffic to it, and then we can connect to it and, and do that traffic analysis where we're, I, we're doing threat hunting, forensic investigations, and hopefully not <laughs> instant response work if there's already existing compromises in the environment. But we have seen that. We've, we've come into environments where nation state threat actors have been hiding their tracks very well, and we're able to uncover those. So um, there are situations where we've had to pivot into an incident response because unbeknownst to the client, uh, they were, they've already been compromised and are currently compromised. Uh, but there are different, there, so there are different options to, to test the service out or the product out. Uh, and they're very, very easy to do because it's out of band and all you need to do is mirror traffic to it. You know, and then over the course of the next few weeks, we're going to log in with you and look at your traffic together to say, hey, like uh, a month ago, month and a half ago, I was uh, involved in a POC with a, a large healthcare a hospital system. And uh, right away, we uncovered some pretty significant vulnerabilities. So I told them, I said, the good news is you have very strong passwords. <laughs> the bad news is they're clear text. They're floating off, the, floating up through the, the network, totally open to anybody who's sniffing your traffic so they can see your end users' passwords. Strong passwords, but in clear text, that's not a very strong security posture. So we help them to remediate that. Uh, but those are just some of the, the findings that might be uncovered in a POC where there might be glaring weaknesses from a hygiene or compliance perspective, or there might be existing um, malicious insiders or external threat actors that have gained a foothold in the environment. And it's just very compelling to see a much deeper level of visibility into what's going on on your network. That's very cool. So we actually have at Comfort, we actually have one of your appliances as a as a demo unit that we've deployed to customers to kind of on that free side. Let's let's put it in your network for 30 days. Let's see what we're seeing. Kind of give that report back. Understand what's going on. And and in every scenario, you're going to run into some aha moment of you know this is good, but this isn't good enough scenarios. And and how to take the existing tools they have and tweak them and dial them in. Um, in, in the case you're talking about, like Let's make sure that our, our password exchanges are encrypted. Um, that web server should be SSL before the login, not after the login, whatever yep. that scenario is, to make that tweet. Yep. Yep. Cool. We've well, that's, that's all the questions I've seen and I have for you. Is there anything else uh, over the next three minutes? Any other words of wisdom from, from Joe? Yeah, I would, I would just say take a close look at your existing tools, right? Um, everybody needs good tools to be able to defend the organization. Uh, those tools can be very noisy. Uh, they can have lots of inaccuracy in them. They can be difficult to use. Uh, a lot of legacy approaches um, are, are using signatures or heuristics or heavily rely on open source threat intelligence, you know, like lists of bad domains or IP addresses that are, are being employed by attackers. Uh, and, and those were all fine and dandy five or 10 years ago, but the threat landscape is always evolving. And so it, it does you know, pay dividends to look at the tools that you have in place, to look at the skill set of the people you have, and to look at the, the processes uh, in place as well. And, and just do an assessment. Is it still providing me with the value that's needed to defend my organization, or do I need to uplift you know, the, the, the products, the services, the processes that are in place uh, to be more secure against today's uh, evolving and more mature, more sophisticated threats. Uh, so doing that assessment, it, it's worthwhile, right? Figuring out, we're getting a lot of false positives from this tool, let's, let's find a better tool to replace that. Uh, or, you know, our, 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 in, our incident responders or, or security analysts are wasting a lot of time with this process, let's find a way to streamline that. All of those things can be done to, to really strengthen the, the security posture uh, of any given organization, and it's time well spent. Very good. 
Well, thank you so much for joining me today and everyone that was on will uh, come to a close here. Um, if When you registered for this event, there's a checkbox on the bottom that I don't remember if it was defaultly on or off. You'll get additional webinar requests. We're gonna try and do these on a frequently frequent basis with other security products and other manufacturers to kind of help bolster our security posture as a whole. Um, if you have any questions, reach out to your, if you're an existing customer, your account executive, if you're not an existing customer, um, respond to the, the email, the invites, and we'll get in contact with you and understand how we can um, increase your security posture and, and make your make your network uh, a safer place. So thank you all for joining today. Thank you, Justin. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thanks Joe.